Father God, we ask this morning that you would help us to do what is impossible for us, to empty our, our hearts, our minds, of all of those things that distract us from you, all of those things that we worry about, that we stress about, that we're constantly thinking about, all of those perhaps even sinful behaviors that are bringing us shame and guilt in this moment. Father, I pray that you would free us from those things, those distractions, from that guilt, those thoughts that are far from you, that our hearts and minds might be filled with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would truly fill us, to help complete us, to make him the focus of our worship this morning, that we might exalt him above all the names. I pray that our hearts this morning would be humbled before you, that they would not stand in the way of our worship, that they would aid us in our worship. Father, we know that our sinful state, our heart produces vileness and wickedness. It is, it is that thing that produces so much sin, and yet we sing of Christ being in our heart. We sing of that redemption and that cleansing that happens within us, and we praise you for that. And we ask you to make that more tangible this morning as we can see you lifting our burdens and freeing us to focus on you, to worship you as our true and sinless hearts one day will never cease from doing. Father, help us to have those resurrection-like moments now, those heaven-like moments now in our worship today where we are fully committed to you, Lord. Father, we pray this and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, for the scripture reading this morning, I'd like to read Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Uh, this morning, I'd like to read the full chapter here. I think that'd be beneficial for us, even though it breaks the rule, Pastor Gary Spikerman told me, of limiting scripture readings. But uh, hopefully we'll be blessed here as we read through this chapter so uh, we can be better equipped in our worship later as we study God's word together. Acts chapter 14. Now at Iconium, they entered, that is Paul and Barnabas, they entered into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat, to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Verse 8. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw that what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycaonian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and, and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from the heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium 
And, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe, where they had preached the gospel to that city and had made desiring and had made disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia, came to Pamphylia, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and there remains no little time with the disciples. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Luke who penned these as he was led by the Holy Spirit, that these words might be preserved and passed on to us today, that we might benefit from the reading of this scripture, that we might see a bit of the life of Paul and Barnabas, their struggles, their pains, but also their triumphs and their joy that certainly were not a work of themselves, but a work of you, Lord. And we see in these men an example of a missionary life, a life of going to unreached people and preaching the gospel, of crossing those cultural barriers, of stepping into that culture and presenting you, Lord, as the one true God, the one true answer to all that their hearts have always longed for. Father, I pray that we would be a church that supports our missionaries, as we always have been, that we would continue to support them, that we would support the local missions opportunities here, because we have so many unreached people here in this culture, in this place and area that we call home. We don't have to cross cultural barriers necessarily to reach people. Though even within this community, there certainly are cultural barriers to be crossed. And Father, I pray that you would equip us, encourage us, inspire us, compel us through the love of Christ to reach the people in this area, to look at this place all around us, everything outside of these walls, and see a mission field one that is ready to be harvested. Father, give us a heart for missions and what we can do to serve in that capacity. Father, we pray this. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, way of announcements, uh, speaking of sort of local missions, I want to remind you there is that uh, note in the bulletin about the Love, Inc. opportunity, uh, August 28th, the program of Simply Give through the Hudsonville Meyer an opportunity to have uh, donations to the food pantry there uh, go a lot further than maybe they normally would. So uh, be mindful of that opportunity to serve and to give uh, towards Love, Inc., a wonderful ministry here uh, in the area. Uh, and outside that, really, the only thing I want to bring to your attention is a letter we received from uh, Sandy Sinke. Uh, it's short. I'll just read it to you, but it's really sweet. Uh, she says, To all my loving friends at Georgetown Grace, thank you so much for the many prayers and expressions of kindness about the homegoing of my dad recently. I am so blessed to be continually remembered by all my church friends. Bill and I miss you all and pray for you frequently. God bless, Sandy Sinky. So, nice little note from Sandy, uh, just expressing how much she appreciates uh, our prayers, our love towards her, even though she's far away uh, with her dad's homegoing. And even with everything they're going through in life, with the move and continued difficulties for that, just a pretty constant struggle for them, but I think one... Uh, that at least Bill has mentioned is worth it with Sandy's pain being diminished uh, there uh, as opposed to being here in cold Michigan. So I uh, just continue praying for them. Be mindful of them. Send them uh, notes of encouragement still as you have. And I know they appreciate that. At this point, I'll open up to our worship team to continue uh, our worship with an instrumental before we sing together again. Well, in our 
Bible study for today, our message for today on this Lord's Day. We find ourselves in Acts chapter 14, which we read earlier. I invite you to turn with me there if you haven't done so already. Uh, this whole chapter is taken together in this message, but uh, we'll be taking it as we often do in parts. And so this is sort of part one of this message. And we find here in Acts 14 some qualities of a great missionary, which is the title I've sort of given to this message, the qualities of a missionary. But it could also be entitled qualities of a servant of Christ, any place, any time. Not necessarily a missionary whom we would assume to be somebody on foreign soil. But since the passage deals with Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey, uh, certainly, these are qualities of a great missionary. We know that every job has qualifications. It doesn't matter what sort of job you're applying for. There are certain qualifications that need to be met. Uh, whenever you apply for a job, you, you fill out an application, and you turn in a resume, and you're interviewed. And, and the questions there are meant to get to know you, but also to determine if you are a good fit, if you qualify for the job. In some, job, some jobs are rather simple in the qualifications that are needed. Other jobs demand more complex qualifications. Some jobs are simple and require some physical dexterity and strength, maybe some limited mental capacity, the ability to follow orders. And even those jobs have qualifications. There are also more complex jobs that require Sometimes mental genius and multiple graduate degrees and psychological fortitude and administration and leadership skills. Those two types of jobs and everything in between have certain qualifications that they each require a person to meet to at least be effective at the job. Usually if you fit those qualifications, you fit the job. And the world is very qualification focused and qualifications are important. They often determine what school you can go to, what teams you can participate with, what orchestras or bands you can participate in, and so many other things. And believe me, if the world is that hung up on qualified people, certainly the church can be no less so. I believe that God's design is to use qualified people. I use that term sort of loosely because as sinners, none of us are truly qualified, but God can make us qualified. Christ can improve us and transform us and make us into his likeness. And it's by God's grace that he uses us in our weaknesses. And so if we as Christians ask ourselves why it seems that we never really get in on what God is doing, it may be that we have not endeavored, that we have not worked to really be qualified for what God is doing. Because I believe God wants highly qualified people. If the world needs qualified people to do everything from flipping burgers to figuring out the scientific formulas to send a person into space, which are both temporary, certainly God wants the most qualified to do the work that he desires to be done, work that is ultimately and eternally significant. So now as we come to Acts chapter 14, we're going to see some qualified people. There are a lot of missionaries in the field who aren't qualified for the work. But there are a lot of missionaries who are. Well, here we have a couple, Barnabas and Paul, who are very qualified. They manifest qualifications that are basic to effective service for Christ. Whether that be for a missionary journey on foreign soil, or whether you be a missionary to your own house and neighborhood. These are qualifications that really render effective service. Now, there are at least eight of them that I find in this chapter, and we'll look at them over the next couple of weeks. But I want to be clear from the beginning that you could read this chapter and never hear of one of these qualifications. And one might argue that I'm reading into the text, but I believe that I'm taking out of the narrative that we see here, some important principles, taking them out of the narrative. The chapter is about Paul and Barnabas who went from Iconium to Lystra to Derby and back again and then went home. And while they were doing it, they were preaching and creating trouble. 
in the flow of that narrative, they exhibit these eight qualities of effective missionary service. Now notice that this here in the text is not a lecture that lists these qualities. This is looking at two men who simply exhibited them in the action of their life, in their character. And I think that's a lot better. Uh, this isn't a chapter where Paul preaches a sermon where he has these eight qualities laid out of being a good missionary. What he does is far better than what I'm doing because he demonstrates it through his life and through his actions. And this chapter is where Paul just exhibits them without saying a single word about them. And we can see them leaping off the page as we take our time through this text. And so here we see them in practice, not just talking about it, but doing it. And so quality number one, which is our quality for the day, that makes for effective missionary service or makes for effective Christian witness is this. It's the ministry of spiritual gifts. Now this is generally revealed through the chapter, and we'll take it just in the general sense, and then we'll get specific beginning at verse 1 and into the flow of the text here. But we know that Paul and Barnabas are the missionaries. Now this is generally revealed through the chapter, that we see this happening. We've seen in recent weeks that the body of Christ has been formed by God through the Apostle Paul, that God established a home base in the Gentile world in a town called Antioch, one of the great major cities of the world that was in Syria. A church was established there and it had these five great leaders, and two of them were Paul and Barnabas. And from those five, the Spirit of God said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And Paul and Barnabas are sent from that church in Antioch into the, uh, what they could reach of the Gentile world. They began what is classically known as their first missionary journey. That's what we're seeing here. Though we know that's not the case. We know that Paul, at least, had spent many years preaching in many areas where he was living as Christ was revealing some of the mystery and other doctrines to him. These men took off to the west. They went to the island of Cyprus. They proceeded across the Mediterranean Sea from Cyprus into an area known as Galatia. We saw that they went to a town called Antioch, not the old Antioch, that's their home base, but Antioch of Pisidia. And they preached Christ there, and, and they created a riot in that city. And they're thrown out of Antioch. But they didn't tuck their tail between their legs and crawl home. They proceeded even further into Asia Minor, even further into the territory that God was calling them to reach, to Galatia, particularly to a town known as Iconium. And as we pick them up there in verse 1, they have arrived at Iconium, carrying the gospel to this pagan world. But the thing that we see in this chapter is they minister, is that they're ministering using their spiritual gifts. A spiritual gift is not... A natural ability. It's not something you exercise in your own strength. It is simply a channel through which the Holy Spirit ministers through you to the body of Christ. There are varying spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, and all believers should be aware of these gifts listed here, of their own spiritual gifts, and how they can be using them to help minister to people. Because that's how God uses you, or that's one way or some ways that God uses you to reach people. And so as we look at these men, we find that they exhibit spiritual gifts. And I want to show you, I want to see this morning, the four dominant ones that they exhibit. The first one is the gift of preaching. One of the spiritual gifts, I believe, is the gift of prophecy or preaching. Now look with me at verse 1. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Here, just simply there, we see them exercising the gift of preaching, this spirit-given ability to declare the gospel of clarity and power. We know there's clarity, we know there's power, because not only did they preach, but they preached, and many people came to faith. Not everybody has that gift, but they had it, they had that gift, and they used it. 
Uh, look at verse 21. So we're skipping quite a ways here. Verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city, that is Derbe that we're speaking of here, verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. There they're doing it again. They're exercising the gift of preaching and what we might even call prophecy here, the proclamation of what God is saying. Verse 25 <clears throat> Verse 25, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. There again, they're speaking. They're using that gift of preaching. They have the ability given to them by the Spirit of God to, excuse me, to proclaim the gospel with power and with effect. And that's the gift of preaching. But they had another gift as well, one that is often associated with the gift of preaching, one that often comes in a combination of the two, but not always, and that's the gift of teaching. They had the gift of teaching also. You'll notice again in verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. In verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. They were strengthening, or what some translations will use, confirming. It's where we often get this word in, in sort of Christian circles of confirmation. They're confirming the souls of the disciples here. The only way to confirm somebody is to establish them in the doctrine of Scripture. And so they exhibited again the gift of teaching, so preaching and teaching here. But there's a third one. Thirdly, they had another gift that I think again goes with spiritual leadership, and it goes with many of the apostles. And they had the gift of exhortation, or what we might call the gift of encouragement. The gift of exhortation is just what it says. It's exhorting people, comfort, or encouraging and comforting people. Sometimes it's exhibited publicly. Sometimes it's exhibited in those one-to-one -one relationships, those more intimate relationships with people, uh, counseling sort of situations. But it's the ability to encourage somebody, not just to make them feel better, but to encourage them on a certain course of action, often repentance or trusting the Lord in those difficult times. So first they would preach the gospel, then they would teach doctrine, then they would encourage people to follow what they had learned, to, to really apply what God was saying to them through that exhortation. And these three gifts belong to these men. Now, verse 22 Again, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And so there we have that exhortation. We have that comforting ministry of Paul and Barnabas. They had another gift, and that is the gift of administration. Gift of administration. The Bible says it claims it to be the ability to put the pieces together to make things function in a spiritual way. Continuing where we just left off in verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They went back after they'd gone through those cities and they'd organized those churches in each city upon the return. And that's sort of this gift of administration or leadership or organization. There's a lot of words we could use for that. They're putting together the pieces that's going to make these churches last, which is a crucial point of a ministry or of a missionary, I should say, or even a pastor. I think every pastor should consider it their job to work themselves out of that job, to prepare a church for the next man that would step into the pulpit and lead them to the next level of growth and ministry in Christ. So every pastor, every missionary is working themselves out of that job, just as Paul and Barnabas did. They establish those churches. They come back to make sure they're strengthened and equipped for the ministry ahead because they know they're leaving. They have other work to be done. So here we have these marvelous insights into what gifts the Holy Spirit granted to these two men, these apostles here. He gave them the gifts of preaching and teaching exhortation and administration these are all leadership gifts certainly those 
Gifts are necessary for the teaching pastor, to the evangelist, to declare the gospel, to teach doctrine, to encourage people to follow it, to organize for the effective functioning of the body. Those are the gifts of leadership. And these men exhibit them here, I believe, as apostles. And I believe they're still gifts that belong to pastors, teachers today, to Christians, lay people as well today. But there are gifts that remain for the body of Christ today, like these leadership gifts. And there's also gifts that don't remain. These ones we've discussed are permanent, if you will. They'll continue being gifts at least until the rapture, at least until the second coming of Christ when he returns and makes all things right. But in addition to these permanent edifying gifts, those ones that exist today, there were special gifts just for the apostles, which we don't have today. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, it says the signs of a true apostle. That's what Paul is saying, and there he says there are some signs as to uh, what belonged to the apostles. He says the signs of a true apostle were performed among you. And then he says here they are, signs and wonders and mighty works. The signs of a true apostle are signs and wonders. The apostles did that. Other men, other leaders, the non-apostles don't do that sort of stuff. But the apostles do. So now Paul says that apostles were given the ability to perform signs and to create these wonders. And they had the ability to perform these mighty deeds. And these are gifts of miracles. These are temporarily given gifts that are there to as we've said multiple times, confirm their ministry, to validate the messenger and their message. It's uniquely for them, these men with a new message to give. If a preacher comes to town and preaches, how are you going to know he's telling the truth, especially in these times? If you've got three guys giving you three messages, the one you believe is the one who raises people from the dead. The one you believe is the one who should, who is actually legitimately making crippled men walk for the first time in their lives. You believe the one who has wonders accompanying him because it shows that God is attaching to his ministry supernatural evidence and that God attached that evidence to these apostles. Now that's the rule for them, but it's not the rule for now because we don't have these signs and wonders now. And so we can't trust those to be evidence that God is validating a message that's given by a particular and specific messenger. So the question is, why don't we need them today? How do we know they're not prevalent today? It's because anybody in any place can determine whether we speak truth, whether preachers, pastors, evangelists, missionaries, or lay people are speaking truth by comparing them with Scripture, with the Word of God. And so Scripture becomes that confirmation today. That becomes what validates a message the messenger today, whereas miracles were the confirmation the day before Scripture was completed. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, Therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It was confirmed to them by signs and wonders and mighty deeds and diverse gifts of the Holy Spirit. So when the gospel was preached in the early days, there were these certain special gifts given to these men in order that they might confirm their message, that the message might be believable as it's accommodated by these supernatural gifts and miracles. So in the days of the apostles, there are not only these permanent kinds of gifts, these leadership gifts, these encouragement, preaching type of gifts, there's also these gifts that were geared to convince unbelievers. The gift of doing miracles is a gift that Paul and Barnabas had. <coughs> Look at verse 3. 
says, so they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Signs and wonders. This also included healing. Look at verse 8. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. They have that gift of healing as well. As we've seen so many times in the book of Acts, it's not a question of sitting around saying, oh, I wish God would use me or I wish God would use my gifts. It's a question of already functioning with your gifts and then being moved by God into these critical situations where he wants you to be used. Remember when we looked at the ministry of the Apostle Peter, uh, especially in Acts 9, where we see the story of the healing of Aeneas. And Peter is, says, the beginning of that little story in Acts 9, Peter was going here and there among them all. He finally had some freedom to leave Jerusalem. And what does he do? He doesn't go vacation. He goes traveling all throughout the land, going here and there among them all. He's going everywhere. He's doing everything. The Spirit of God put him there and put him there and then he put him there and he just kept doing these things. And I told you at the time when we studied that, that God doesn't dust off crusty Christians who haven't done anything and then stick them in critical situations. God uses people who are already overdone, who are busy, who are actively ministering in their gifts. In the flow of the Christian life, he ought to be ministering his gifts. As you minister your gifts, just in the flow of life, the Spirit of God will direct you to the strategic places where you're going so that you and your ministry can be sort of maximized by what God is doing. From the time of Paul's conversion, he began to minister. It's in that same chapter that he was saved that we see he's preaching in Damascus that we see from other contexts of letters that he's going places and establishing churches and preaching even as he's still learning these new things and revelations from Christ. He preached and he kept preaching and he never stopped preaching and he never stopped teaching. Paul from the very beginning began to minister his gifts and consequently when it became time for Barnabas to look for somebody good, somebody effective to help him in Antioch the one guy that he wanted was the guy who was functioning already, who was doing the work already. And so Barnabas sort of chased him all over the place until he eventually found him. He found Saul, now called Paul, and he hauled him off to Antioch to become sort of his co-pastor there in that church. The reason for that is because the Spirit of God is always in the business of collecting people who are functioning already. A missionary once said that if a person isn't a missionary at home, it's inevitable. 99 times out of 100, they never become a missionary on the field. Because where you are geographically, where you're located, has really nothing to do with your commitment. And missionary people, organizations, they look for people who are already functioning people. And the Holy Spirit has always done that. And so when the Holy Spirit wanted a couple of missionaries to go to Cyprus and then to Antioch of Pisidia, then to travel all throughout Galatia, he didn't get some new group of converts and say, now, let me have a couple of you who aren't doing anything. You're not on any committee. You're not working over here and doing evangelism. You're not involved in a children's ministry. You're basically doing nothing. I want to send you all the way to Antioch of Pisidia, where there are going to be difficulties, which is one really tough place to go. He didn't do that. He picked two of the busiest guys in the whole Gentile world and church, Paul and Barnabas, and said, get out there. You're my men. That's the way God operates. And so we find then that to begin with, really effective missionary service, a 
missionary work here or abroad, wherever it happens, requires, it demands the ministry of spiritual gifts. If you're not ministering your spiritual gifts and you're not functioning in the way that the Spirit of God has designed you to function, and if you don't know what that might be, what your gifts might be, try reading Romans 12. Try reading 1 Corinthians 12 while praying for wisdom and discernment. And go and serve. Even if you're not sure what those might be, go and serve and see how God is effectively using you. You might find that you're a much better preacher, a much better teacher than you ever imagined. You might find that you truly are a person who cares about aligning people with the will of God, that you have this gift, not just of making people happy, but of encouraging them to go with God and to follow his will. The Bible is very strong in urging us to do this. Romans chapter 12, Paul is on pretty thick here. He says, having gifts that differ, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but he says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, that is, use it in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. If those are your gifts, use them. Don't ignore them. Peter likewise, though sometimes seeming to butt heads with the Apostle Paul, comes to the same conclusion in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. If you've got some gifts, use them. Because they're not even yours. You are a steward of them. You are a steward of God's varied grace. You're holding these gifts in trust for God. So don't waste them. Use them. Determine your gift and use it. That is the beginning of any effective service, any effective ministry. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that at the moment of salvation we receive so much as adoption, as sons and daughters, as those who are redeemed, purchased by the blood of Christ, that blood that also washes us away, that we, are, we go from being enemies of God to your children, that we have all of these new things happening. We become a new creation. We receive a resurrected life as in that moment we identify not just with death but with the eternal life of Christ. All of these things we receive, and yet we also receive a gift. Many gifts, spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit uses through us to equip, to encourage, to strengthen the body. Every single one of us in this room who believes in Christ as Savior, and Lord, I pray that is everybody here. We each have at least a gift, and I think multiple gifts, gifts that aren't even mentioned necessarily by, by Paul in his letters. We have gifts that don't come from us because nothing good really comes from us, but we have gifts that come from you. We have gifts that are on loan from you that we can use to make the lives of each and every person in this room better to comfort and to encourage, to teach and to correct. Father, I pray that we would not only think of our neighborhood, our community as a mission field as we leave this place, but we would open our eyes in this moment and we would look around to the people in this room and we would see them as an opportunity to serve and to love and to grow and to be connected with them that we might be a church of powerful, powerful love 
and humility and grace. Father, we pray these things. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.